Mayor's choice. Well, we, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna ultimately use the barns as part of this. No, we haven't been using the barns at all, other than the Rhinebeck Science Foundation event. Yeah, but that, yeah, that's, that's just a, a, not commercially, I should say. And, and what we wanted, and part of the reason that we want to get going, the manor house needs the work, and some of the exterior pieces, the cornices are falling off, there's severe water damage, and we've got to fix that. That's also, it's also the long lead item. It's going to take two years to, to do all that work in the manor house. So these other, these other things, as we're figuring them out, we can come back to the planning board, and we have approval for, the barns is part of what we defined as phase one. We just then broke phase one into phase 1A and phase 1B. In order to get phase 1A going, which is really the manor house and just a few of the cottages. Phase 1B, uh, as approved, does include the stone barns. Um, the work on the stone barns wouldn't take nearly as long as the work on the manor house, um, and the manor house is, is in dire need of it. That's why we're trying to just get going on this. That's why we broke it into phase 1A and 1B. <coughs> and we, and we, can't get, we can't use these buildings commercially until we have a CO. So all of that you know, needs to be first approved and finalized, I mean, it's been approved, but we need to satisfy the outside agency conditions for phase 1B. We then need to do the construction, and then we need to get the construction approved, um, meaning the building inspector needs to sign off on it and issue us a certificate of occupancy. All of that needs to happen before we can, uh, before we can really operate this uh, commercially as a country and two. Other than what we've done more for community organizations, um, I mean, we'd like to continue allowing the Rhinebeck Science Foundation to use the, the property, um, but we're, we're not using that commercially, meaning we're not taking money for them. At this point, there can be no commercial use of the barns because there's no permit or site plan approval for doing so, no CO. Well, if, if there's a situation like that happening, it, it, it needs to be reported to the zoning enforcement officer because it would be a violation. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's where the enforcement comes in is to the, to the ZEO. Yeah, I, I, I think it might look sort of odd to have two sets of them that way. Um, what we want to do, I mean, our, our goal for that entrance is to keep it very subdued. We want it to feel like you're entering a, an old country estate, not a large commercial establishment. Um, so what we are going to be looking to do is something that, that keeps the sort of, that sort of sensibility and that kind of look and feel, um, not some big grandiose thing. Um, but but the idea is to is to is to keep those two pillars in place because that that serves as that sort of straight line, um, which is really nice. Um, it just doesn't work as an entrance from because of line of sight. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Any other questions from the public? And back to the planning board. Here. I'm sorry, go oh, ahead. No. I just have one comment uh, on the approvals resolution, uh, if number four could be reworded, because that's what started this whole stuff for the last hour. Yeah. Okay, how, how would, what would you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's because it says we're removing the subdivision condition, and I know on the on the previous approval on there it does state that the, the 250 acres uh, is part of that. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if we said removing the 250 acre condition contained within the resolution of whenever the approval resolution was, because that's where it was contained, yeah, or defer the requirement for the later phases, or uh, well, if we, uh, well, it, because you're saying deleting it, so 
deleting means just taking it away, and I think that's mm -hmm. well. You, you, you are you are deleting the con you are deleting the condition as previously established. But There's then no you should say it. maybe why and, and how it's going to be addressed in the future. Well, that's why it says it's and here. It says the condition is being deleted because it is not required under the code. That's number one. And it goes on to explain that, and then I suggested that. Uh, notwithstanding this deletion of the provision, uh, the applicant be required to submit acknowledgement, certified acknowledgement, whatever you want to say, of the minimum 250 acre requirement for issuance and for purposes of issuance and maintenance of site plan approval and special use permit for the country N2, beginning with the initial stamping and signing by the chair of the phase 1A site plan. That says when he has to do it, he has to submit before that site plan is to and continuing through to issuance and maintenance of a certificate of occupancy for the country into that takes it from today to forever yeah. michael yes does it help to add the words on one parcel the creation of a minimum 250 acre 250 acres on one particular parcel isn't that the condition that we're trying to eliminate? I, I believe, yeah, that is the ultimate, yes. So for me, the, it helps if you say that the condition you're trying to eliminate is the need for 250 acres on a single parcel. parcel yeah. So if yes. we could add those words in there, that would be helpful to me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the only reason it said, said differently is that it, that it quoted directly the language of the resolution. Then put it in parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I think Edna's statement clarifies exactly but, yeah. I'm sorry, that brings up my question. Sharon read a paragraph from the, uh, what I assume was the code, that said that it would be on one lot. A minimum lot of 250 acres. A minimum lot of 250 acres. Art read something that said it could be combined lots, but this seems to say, I don't know if that's directly from the code the or if it's the, the paraphrase. The, the, next, the next sentence is the one that reads, when an applicant proposes a country and two development on a parcel or combined parcels of land in excess of 250. Right, but the first one would then say that combined parcel has to be one lot made in, they're in other words. They're all in the same sentence, huh? but they're all in the same section. They're in the, they're in the same. And, and contradicting each other. Yeah, they're, but, and they're not contradictory if they are a single lot. That's the only way it's not contradictory. Otherwise, we're creating controversy. Mm -hmm. Just hold one second. We're looking at the definition of lot. No. 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 Oh. Of lot? Forget that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is at a matter of interpretation. And I, 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 you know, I, well, like I said, if if it's on a lot, there is no controversy at all. That's if it's true. If it remains more than one lot, then it becomes an issue. It it can become an issue through interpretation. Well, no, I. I know what you're saying, and I, I think part of the problem with it is it does not. In other words, it's not it's not ambiguous uh, ambiguous if it's one lot. True. If you then say it doesn't have to be one lot, you've made it am ambiguous. No, but when it says combined lots, but it doesn't say combined in what way, the, then it, well, refer then it the references first, the first paragraph. Then says what way it has to be. Mm, it, it says 250. It's, you're talking about 250. A lot of 250 yeah, acres. Lot a Certainly. lot of 250 acres. It says a lot. A, a minimum lot of 250 acres. A minimum. The bold language. A minimum says, lot area of 250 gross acres. So to me, a lot is a lot. That's one. But. When you're talking, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's when you're talking a lot area. It, and I, you know, I tried looking up definitions and everything yesterday. I spent a lot of time yeah. yesterday looking up different things. And a lot is a lot. And if you combine them, Combine means to add them together. But so I'm getting the, con the idea that consensus of a majority opinion here is to delete that <laughs> section, that 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 portion uh, for from the resolution tonight. Now, the the absolute minimum that the the applicant the absolute minimum the applicant requires tonight is paragraph five. I don't have a, I don't. That's have a, the extension. 
Yes. You need an extension beyond Oh, yeah, no problem there. Oh, that's okay. All, right. all, the, other, all the others, so, so, yes. Yeah, all the, you know, all the others are, you know, the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the amendment to the site plan and uh, that sort of thing is fine. But the one absolute that the applicant requires this evening is the extension. Okay. So, so if what I'm hearing is do we just, for purposes of this evening, and uh, delete from that resolution? Well, I don't have that. I apologize. I don't have that resolution in front of me, but I assume it has all the other items we've identified. If we leave all the others and take out the lock consolidation mm -hmm. paragraph, yeah, can we can we get that done tonight? Uh, well, let me read it, and we'll read it, and we'll see what people think. And then leave leave us on. Perhaps close the hearing, and then just leave us on for discussion at the next meeting on the lock consolidation question. I. How do you all feel? It, that sounds idea. acceptable. Sounds acceptable. So, all right. Uh, Michael, the uh, uh, with the yeah with the deletion of paragraph four, and obviously par number numbering paragraph five is four. Resolution stands as, as written, except for uh, simply submitting uh, submitting uh, inserting uh, the drawing numbers. Okay, uh, on, and we can do that. Uh, yeah. Other than that, it, it, it stands. Now, shall we hold this public <coughs> hearing open? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see. Okay. I didn't mean to say lock consolidation. I meant to say the 250 yeah. acre condition. Issue. Remove, remove right. the condition. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's worded sorry. in the resolution. Oh, no, so we know that you need the consolidation. Lock consolidation. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 yeah, we know you need that. And the extensions. Okay. The, the other question is how do, you, how do you deal with this question of uh, the, lot, uh, uh, the lot issue? Mm -hmm. It's not a planning board call. No. Uh, uh, if the planning board is deferring this particular, uh, uh, has a question and is deferring on this particular item, uh, I don't believe you have any recourse then but to refer the question to the CEO. To the zoning enforcement right. officer, yeah. Right. So in, in, uh, in lieu of paragraph four, I think you uh, would, would include uh, a, a referral of the matter to the CEO. Yeah, I mean, point, here's one, one, I mean, just based on what people were saying. I mean, having Before the- you can combine. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Is, is if we have the ability in the future to come back and say, now we're going to make it 250 acres, and we just combine not just these two, but then that other one, is that, you know, so we have a sum total of 500 acres with the ability to shrink it down to 250 in the future, when we have a clear sense of our where the site plan is going to go, uh, ultimately, is that going to, would that be acceptable? Oh, that absolutely. would be, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. easy way out to avoid a two yeah. or three year court proceeding. Yeah, oh, all right. <laughs> I, I just wanted to clarify that because that's an easier thing to do than to try to, to yeah. try to create 250 now and then have to redo yeah. 250 later if we change anything. So, um, so okay, all right. So if, as long, if that's the case, then we'll, I guess we'll be talking to Marie Welch yeah. over there. <laughs> so, so, so I'm guessing what we want to do tonight, we can close the public hearing on this amendment because it's then going to be a, a, a subdivision application to combine and that will require a new hearing process. Okay. So, having said that, could I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Very good. Have you guys read this resolution? You've all read it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, we're going to delete. Number paragraph four. Paragraph four, and the rest stands as written. Except for, uh, uh, just for reference, uh, on, on paragraph three A, um, Depicted on drawing numbers CS110 and CS110A, uh, prepared by Greenman Pedersen, and dated January 7th. Excuse me, Mark, do you happen to have an extra copy of that? I just. Okay. Um, could, I hear, could I hear a motion to approve? Oh, so move. Second. <laughs> any, any discussion? I'm not sure what just changed. Okay, I'll, I'll pull the board. Uh, Eric, aye. Edna, aye. Sharon, aye. Melody, aye. and I'll vote aye. Okay. Um, uh, should we ask right now? Oh, Woody. Woody. Oh, Woody. Woody. <laughs> Don't you want to be part of this? Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Wise decision. Okay. Could, could, actually, could we, we've got one question. I don't know if it's possible to do this or not, but would it be possible to set the public hearing tonight on the lot consolidation with the 450-acre parcel? It wouldn't because we need to have the application. You need to have everything. So okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought that was probably yeah, the case. I thought I'd ask. I'm just trying to save Shoot for the meeting. August. What's our second meeting in August? The second meeting in August. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And but we should do what, that. We can set it up. Um, I would imagine we should be able to do, set up the public hearing and whatnot, and then in September, you know, work, finish it out. I don't think there's any objection to a consolidation okay. of, of that larger portion into the other two. Okay. 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 Um, okay. 
Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, you get a we did. Okay. It was bad. Okay. Our next public hearing. Um, this is uh, Glenn Birnbaum on behalf of Arvia Morris, 110 Stone Church Road and 8 Crosby Lane, Subdivision Plat. Conduct a public hearing on the application by Glenn um, Birnbaum on behalf of Arvia Morris, Marie T. Welsh agent. Oh, hi, Marie. Uh, for subdivision plat approval under Town Code Chapter 101, subdivision of land in the matter of a proposed nine acre lot line alteration between parcels at 110 Stone Church Road and 8 Crosby Lane within the Rural Countryside RC5 District, the proposed action being an amendment to filed map 5409 and has been classified as an unlasted action under Seeker. Marie. The project that was just described is a property on Stone Church Road. Um, Arvia Morris actually owns 72 acres, uh, or 74 acres, and her frontage, she has frontage on both Stone Church Road and Crosby Lane, and her house and, and the majority of her uh, buildings are on Crosby Lane, and she's always owned this piece of property that uh, extended out to Stone Church Road. Um, Glenn Birnbaum is the owner of a house, a garage, small shed, that front, that's at 110 Stone Church Road. And he has, uh, uh, would like to be able to expand his uh, property by this nine acres that is pr pr shown on this lot line, proposed lot line alteration. The property is in a conservation easement and it will remain in conservation easement. And we have been in touch with Winnicky Land Trust, who the holder of the conservation easement, and the building envelope that was created on the Morris property has been moved to the property that Mr. Birnbaum is looking to acquire. Um, specifically, he would like to put a barn up on the property. And so he's actually, the increase of his road frontage that he will be getting on this lot line alteration is about 56 feet. Um, and the rest of the property borders him in the back and extends into lands of Morris. So uh, I walked board members, Richard Murray and Eric Blom, around the property and Ryan uh, from the Conservation Advisory Board went with us and um, I'm sure that Eric will uh, speak about his uh, visit and Rich was actually in love with the property and he's ready to build a cabin up there but um, he said not to tell you, Glenn, sorry. Um, so anyway, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's nine acres being cut out of Morris to be combined, to become part and parcel of lands of Birnbaum. Eric. Uh, well, first I'm going to read the email from Richard. He said, Eric, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make the meeting tonight. If asked, I found no issues during the site visit at 110 Stone Church Road. I believe that the easement issue is the only real restriction that needs to be confirmed. Uh, sorry for the service. Um, and uh, I concur. I didn't see any uh, issues with it. Um, the uh, property is uh, already uh, being sort of uh, used and maintained by the new owner. Um, and he does a wonderful job of that, I might point out. Um, and uh, it's, uh, and I, I concur with Richard that uh, I covet the place too, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and we do have a sign off letter from Winnicky on it, so they're, so that's, they're all that's on board. Settled. The easement issues have been resolved. Very good. Uh, Ryan? Oh, there you are. Good evening, Chair. Uh, like uh, Marie said, we attended the site site visit and we didn't see any issues with the lot lot line changes, so we were all set. Thank you. Um, questions from the planning board? Uh, any members of the public come to speak on this particular application? Okay, well, I have a seeker resolution, which I will read in brief. Uh, pursuant to the Planning Board's classification of the proposed action as an unlisted action under seeker, determines upon its review of the short EAF Part 1 and its own completion of the next e short EAF Part 2, 
in consideration of both the criteria for determining significance <coughs> set forth in Title VI, Part 617.7C, NYCRR. The proposed action, as described above, will cause no potential significant adverse impact on the environment and thus issues a negative declaration, determination of non-significance under seeker, giving an environmental impact statement to not be required and stating that such will not be prepared. Authorizes the chair to so execute the short EAF and directs the planning board clerk to distribute and file the executed determination of significance in the manner set forth within the seeker implementing regulations, Title VI, Part 617.12, NYCRR. <coughs> Could I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Could I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. I will move right along to an approval resolution. Okay, know what this is all about. Okay. Grants waivers from certain requirements stated at Town Code Chapter 101, Subdivision of Land, Subsection 101-7.1b, Paragraph 7, 11, and 12, in consideration of the absence of any proposed physical changes to the modified lots upon alteration of their shared boundary. Approves the above cited application uh, by Glenn Birnbaum on behalf of Arvia Morris, Marie T. Welsh Land Surveyor Agent, in the matter of proposed Morris subdivision lot line alteration with Birnbaum and authorizes the chair to stamp and sign the subdivision plat upon the applicant's satisfaction of each of the below conditions or requirements within 180 calendar days of the adoption of the resolution. Stamping and signing of the subdivision plat is non-jurisdictional subdivision or for filing purposes only by the Dutchess County Health Department. Submission of subdivision plat drawings in the form and number specified within Town Code Chapter 101, except as may be modified to, as to a lesser extent by the chair in consideration of filing and distribution requirements, and including all required stamp seals, certifications, and as, as may be required, agricultural district notation. Submission of a draft of, con of a consolidation or merger deed in a form suitable for recording in the Dutchess County Clerk's Office coincident with the filing of the approved subdivision plat so as to obviate what otherwise would be the creation of a freestanding non-complying parcel. Payment of any outstanding fees and or reimbursable amounts to the Town of Rhinebeck. In taking this action, the Planning Board notes there are no new lots or additional housing sites created through this subdivision. Accordingly, neither the provision of the Town Code addressing set-aside of recreational or other open space land, nor the provision addressing the development of affordable housing is deemed applicable to this subdivision. <coughs> Crew, let I hear a motion to approve. So moved. And second. second. Any discussion? I'll pull the board. Woody? Aye. Eric? Aye. Edna? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Melody? Aye. And I will vote aye. Thank you an establishment of a one-bedroom detached accessory dwelling unit on 15-acre parcel at 18 Haggerty Hill Road in the Rural Countryside RC5 District, being the subject of prior Dutchess County Health Department approval and classified as an unlisted action under seeker. Michael, yes. I'm going to recuse myself from this application because it's an immediately adjoining property. Ah, okay. Thank you, Edna. Uh, good evening. Mark Levinsky uh, representing LXMI. Holdings. Uh, the purpose of this application, it's, it's actually a, a reapplication to the planning board. Um, application was made in 2014 uh, by LXMI for uh, site plan approval for an accessory structure, and a, a principal dwelling in an accessory structure. And as part of that approval, um, the, uh, it was, uh, the, the approval was uh, uh, based upon construction of the accessory structure first and then following uh, with the uh, construction of the principal residence. And in doing that, the, uh, so the approval was in 2014 was granted uh, by the planning board along uh, with uh, health department approval uh, being obtained uh, uh, for uh, on-site water supply and sewage disposal uh, for both of those structures. And that accessory structure was, uh, building permit was applied for and actually uh, granted, and, uh, and then a uh, CO was issued for uh, the uh, accessory structure along with you know, certification to uh, the Dutchess County Department of Health that the sewage disposal system as it relates to um, the entire project, but and specifically that accessory structure, that certification was done by me. And so uh, those, so that all occurred starting in 2014. Applicant came back in um, earlier uh, this year for uh, applying for a building permit for the principal residence. And at that time, uh, there was a, um, there was no signed site plan. Um, on record with the town, um, the, uh, at the time the um, agent for the applicant presenting did not 
uh, you know, did not obtain a, a signed site plan for uh, from the town. So when that uh, building permit was applied for, um, the uh, zoning enforcement officer indicated the need to go back to uh, the planning board for reapproval of this project. Um, that being said, uh, the um, parcel is uh, located on the uh, north side of Haggerty Hill Road. Uh, this parcel is 15 acres in size, created by previous subdivision, and uh, so it's a it's a flag lot. Uh, access is by a, a single driveway that travels from uh, Haggerty Hill Road uh, to the building site. Uh, total distance of the driveway is about 900 feet, um, and so it, it enters into the site. And so, on uh, shown on this site plan is uh, the location of the existing uh, one bedroom. Uh, accessory dwelling um, that's, that's already been constructed and, um, and approved. And then also what's uh, shown on this site plan is, a, uh, is the, proposed, um, the pro proposed principal residence uh, for, the, uh, for the site. It's a five bedroom principal residence. There was a, um, uh, at the application that was um, discussed or the site plan that was discussed at the last meeting, there was some uh, question with regard to um, some of the architecture on the property, specifically uh, relating to a, uh, a carport, uh, which was attached uh, on the uh, south side of the property. And also, um, there was a walkout on the uh, western portion of the, uh, um, of the building. Uh, per the discussion with this board at the meeting, those two items were eliminated uh, as, as, as part of this as part of the current application, indicating that uh, we'd uh, look at it and then have the possibility of coming back and uh, discussing those items with the planning board. So this, this so and so I, I submitted a revised site plan showing that information and revising the grading on the site plan to uh, to, re to reflect that information. So that, um, along with that, one of the um, uh, one of the other items that was uh, um, that was addressed as part of this is, uh, and there's a note in the uh, lower portion of the site plan with regard to uh, some a driveway turnout uh, that was uh, that was an item that was brought up by the CEO. Um, I site inspected the property, and there's a. Uh, a, a New York State Building Code requires that you have a turnout every 500 feet on a, on a driveway that exceeds 500 feet. So uh, there's a location right at around 500 feet where there, it does not require any tree clearing and would allow for a turnout to be constructed there. There's actually another uh, location around 250 feet uh, where it can very easily have accommodate uh, vehicles to pull off without any tree clearing. Uh, it would be on the west side of the, uh, of, of the flag portion of the lot or the existing driveway uh, where there's, there's large trees, there's some large maple trees there and a couple large locust trees. So it, it, it uh, accommodates that without any tree clearing uh, required. Um, the, um, uh, and, and as I said, this, this, um, this particular application is just for the principal residence. And I should note, you know, shown on here is the, also, the septic system, which was installed uh, for the um, for the accessory uh, dwelling, um, there was a separate tank uh, installed for the accessory dwelling, and the tile field, the absorption field, was above for the entire project, which includes the principal and the uh, uh, principal dwelling and the accessory structure. That's also been installed and, and, and certified to the health department. Uh, also, um, you know, prior to the meeting, uh, the uh, when, uh, I was uh, notified that the board received some uh, documents uh, from uh, neighbors concerning this project, uh, with regard to some deed restrictions that are uh, associated with this property. So I, I note that um, I've uh, obtained you know copies of those uh, um, letters uh, from the neighbors. And have um, I will forward those to the uh, to the applicant uh, and to the uh, also to the applicant's attorney uh, tomorrow for uh, 
you know, to start consideration of uh, some of the comments that the uh, and concerns that the neighbors have. Thank you, Mark. Um, who did the site visit to? Woody. I did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to admit it, were you? I did, and he did. Okay. Richard. Let him speak first. He doesn't. He, <laughs> he apparently doesn't have much to say. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think he sent you a note. I believe or sent me a note, and I think I copied you on it today. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we both concurred that we see no planning board issues of any significance. Okay. Okay. Also, note that there was a, a letter from the, uh, you know, a note from the CAB uh, with regard to, um, you know, the item that was checked off in the uh, uh, environmental assessment form with regard to, um, you know, endangered species. And so the applicant did uh, retain ecological solutions to take a look at that and have done a preliminary um, investigation or report and just actually obtained it today so I provided a draft copy to uh, uh, the CAB but we'll uh, forward that information to the town. Okay, thank you. Ryan? Good e evening again board. Um, we reviewed the uh, report and uh, we find it satisfactory to uh, the concerns that were raised within the short EAF so we have no issues environmentally from this from this time. So, okay, thank you. Uh, questions from board members. Oh. Oh. Yes, <laughs> members of the public. Yes. Um, just speak up. <laughs> Hello. Um, so my husband and I, we live at um, 12 and 16 Haggerty Hill Road, and we're really worried about what's going on next door at number 18. And um, if I get flustered, this is pretty much my worst nightmare to be talking in front of everyone. So. Um, basically, we're part of um, the same subdivision, as well as being neighbors, and there are deed restrictions that run with the land, um, and that's for us and our neighbor, Joseph, at Lot 1A, we're Lots B and C, and also Alex and I, who are Lot 2. Um, and, you know, we've always just been of the opinion that these deed restrictions are a good thing because they um, preserve the rural environment and they protect privacy and ensure peace of mind um, in case of any violations. And unfortunately, they've just been ignored, um, you know, from beginning to end with this project. Um, per the deed restrictions, we've got the right to approve or deny or mediate the design and the siting of any structures that are located south of the creek on Lot 2, um, and this hasn't been respected. Um, when we saw um, signs of construction at the site in December 2014, we took the architect's word that the um, project was already approved. Um, we had we didn't feel like we had any option to, but to make the best of it at that point. And we were new to the area, so we just sort of were rolling with it. Um, the accessory building is built, and um, in, since then we just kind of heard a lot of rumors about the size and scale of the new building that would be going up for the proposed main dwelling. Um, so this year we asked um, Alex and I to share the up-to-date design and siting with us, and we were told we had no worries to be concerned because they have our best interests at heart. Um, after some to and fro, we got some information, but then after a request for clarification, we got a legal letter stating that our rights, our formal rights, had already been exercised by our predecessor. Um, we've been in touch with Mr. Gossett, who had the properties before us, um, and he's adamant that he didn't exercise or forfeit his rights or our rights, um, and he did send a letter to that effect yes, we today. we received that today. Yeah, and he... Um, references a couple of conceptual photographs that he received in early 2014 from the owners um, via um, Deschard, who had the properties before. Now those, and you know, I think they're taking those to be design plans, but they're not design plans. They're, they're, these, they're these photos. These are somebody else's house in Pennsylvania. These are not like their plan. These are, you know, you know, you just 
Google modern farmhouse and up it pops. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they wanted to do is build a modern farmhouse, but again, this is someone else's house. Um, and in any case, the, the um, previous owner of our properties didn't approve that. He had questions about that. He said he was willing to see um, other submissions from them. Um, so anyway, you've got his letter. Um, and also one from our neighbor on lot 1A, who's also been kept in the dark of all of this. His parents are here right now um, representing him. Well, anyway, so it just seems like, on, you know, when you talk about it, that it's enough space to build exactly what you want. But um, most of it's wetlands. Um, the top of it's not really accessible because you've got the creek in the middle. And the building um, envelope that's there is really small. And it's not really, in our opinion, compatible with this compound that's been planned. Um, the, um, the main dwelling is squeezed up as close as it can be to the buffer zone with us. Um, and it contradicts the deed restrictions, um, which say that any structure should enhance or preserve the woods, the, the natural environment, which in this case is woods. Um, it's a modern V-shape, it's architecturally busy, it has a patchwork of external finishes, and we're not really sure what those are because the question hasn't been answered by LXMI. Um, and if the roof was to match the accessory building, then it would be a shiny silver, which doesn't, you know, shines brightly in the sun and it just would draw even more attention. So just a few things um, to finish up our main points. Um, this proposed main dwelling is 40 to 50% bigger than the deed restrictions permit, depending on whether the carport is included or not, in the floor area. And without the carport, it's twice the size of a regular house. Um, actually, this is kind of interesting, at um, approximately 115 feet, it's um, longer than the Rhinebeck Motel, so it's big, you know? It's not a little house that we can just easily ignore and go on our merry way. And you know, it's taller than the Rhinebeck Motel as well. It's actually, um, the deed restrictions say it can be two stories max, but it's actually appearing two and a half stories from the front and three and a half from the rear if they do expose that basement. And that's what um, us and the other owner of lot, lot one will see. And, um, you know, I'm trying to keep it simple, but it gets confusing, mainly because of the way that the plans have been presented, because uh, the carport and the walkout basement have been removed from the plans at this point. Um, but these elements are clearly remaining part of the final goal. Um, per, per the engineer, I believe they want to start construction and not be held up waiting on the variances. And um, that's not really cool. They should be dotting I's and crossing T's before doing their construction, because they will be putting in that giant basement, and it will add to the floor area, you know, whether it's finished or not, um, in, in the interim. And so, you know, um, to conclude, you know, we've been playing a game of catch-up on this, um, with multiple visits to the town hall, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. We don't understand why the septic right there should be sized for seven bedrooms when only five are shown on the map between, um, sorry, on the plan between the main house and four, four, there's actually only four bedrooms in the house and one in the um, gas cottage, I believe. But in any case, it doesn't come to seven. Um, and, you know, a septic of that size involves, you know, taking down more trees than they would have needed to for a smaller one. Um, it's right next to the buffer yet again, it actually juts into the buffer a little bit. And the expansion field that just keeps getting lost off of the site plan is actually to the south of where you see now, which is right smack bang in the buffer zone with us, which is woodsy and would be an eyesore if all of those trees came down. And kind of sticking with that theme, when the main house is built, it's so close to the buffer that I'm sure that some of those trees might get knocked down too or damaged in some way, like which would be violating the deed restrictions. So, you know, in our opinion, <coughs> LXMI just need to lay all of the cards on the table for us and the owners of lot one, um, the other owner of lot one, sorry, and the neighbor, the neighbors and also for the planning board so we can all make educated decisions, not just of what they're asking for today, but what they're asking for in the long term. Um, and even the engineer here who's working on this from the beginning wasn't even aware of the deed restrictions until a few weeks ago, uh, which has prompted the, you know, you know, prompted a few worries, I'm sure, for everybody. but. You know, we filed those um, with our application, and here they are. You know, he didn't even know about them, and he's part of the team. So um, I don't know. In our in our humble opinion, um, transparency needs to be prioritised and guaranteed moving forwards. And um, I just want to say thanks for your time. Thank you. 
Um, other members of the public? Yes. Uh, my name is Gary Locke. Gary, can you, can, what? But, but it's for filming purposes so that it also helps when, when Gretchen has to do our minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name is Gary Lockman. We live at 20 Haggerty Hill Road. The Chawlas, the people behind LXMI Property Holdings LLC, are our immediate neighbors to the west. Um, as was mentioned before, this project originally came before the planning board in October 2014. And at that meeting, we raised some questions mainly pertaining to whether a permit for an accessory dwelling could be issued in the absence of a principal residence. Our concern at that point is that if, the, if such permission were given and the principal residence was never constructed, we would be left with a property immediately adjoining ours that had clearly non-conforming zoning, zoning violations, zoning issues, I'm not sure what, but it would contain an accessory building that was accessory to nothing. Um, two of the questions that, we, uh, that were discussed that night are relevant to tonight's meeting. The first was whether the proposed dwelling, the one that currently exists, met the zoning laws requirements for a primary residence? And the answer to that question was in the affirmative. The second question was, if the board granted approval to begin construction of the accessory dwelling, and by the time the C of O was applied for, there still was no primary residence, what would happen? And what Art Broad stated was that if that condition existed, the accessory dwelling, the one that exists, would be deemed to be the principal residence. And the C of O would reflect its status as principal residence. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, that's not what happened, but that's a slightly different issue at the moment. Further, if the owner decided at a later date to construct another dwelling, it would be deemed accessory. And if the proposed accessory dwelling were in front of or larger than, et cetera, the uh, deemed principal residence, some variances would be required, which might or might not be granted. Alternatively, um, the owner could petition the planning board to essentially swap designations between primary residence and accessory dwelling, and that might or might not be granted. Um, so anyway, rather convoluted issue, but we asked some very, very clear questions and we got some very clear answers, and on the basis of those assurances, we did not oppose the application. Absent those assurances, we very clearly would have opposed it, but it's all on tape. Mm -hmm. um, so through some chain of events, we seem to be back exactly where we were two and a half years ago. Um, there is still no uh, principal residence on the property, and based now on hearing from both owners who, under the deed restrictions, have the right to review the design of the house, I think it should be clear to everyone that there are very serious issues with the proposed design. Um, there is no building permit, obviously, for this. Uh, there is a design for one, as mentioned, but it's been contested under the terms, and it is quite uncertain what effect that is going to have on the timing of the construction of any additional residence on the property. This is going to be subject to negotiation, possible mediation, and possible litigation. So, you know, the, the construction of a second residence has been deferred for some protracted uh, period, or it might not occur at all. It may be that any design that will be signed off by the two owners of Lot 1 is a house that the Chalas don't want to build. So there's a very real possibility that this issue never comes back to the planning board because the, if there's no principal residence, it doesn't come back here. Okay. Um, okay. So bottom line is I don't see any way that this proposal can be, this, this application can be approved by the planning board. This is not personal. Our concern back then and now is that any development of this property basically is in accordance with Rhinebeck zoning law. The simplest and I think the least disruptive approach is basically to go back to what Art Broad said in October of 2014. Deem the existing residents to be primary. 
That solves the issue from the perspective of the planning board because now the formal structure of the property is in complete accordance with the, with the true situation on the ground. And if there is a decision to go ahead with a second residence, it comes back to the planning board and any remaining issues can be dealt with at that point. But I am very reluctant to support the uh, a board approval, which basically leaves an unusual situation potentially in place for perpetuity. Um, An alternative, of course, would be to leave the status of the current dwelling indeterminate. And that would require not amending the um, current certificate of occupancy, but revoking it entirely. That, of course, would render the building uninhabitable until another CO certificate of occupancy were granted. That presumably would be for accessory dwelling structure, but it would be as part of an application for the construction of a, of a true primary residence. The difficulty with that is by rendering the building uninhabitable, you probably have caused m still more difficulties for the Chalas. At any rate, I see those as basically the two reasonable possibilities that are open to the board. Um, at the October 20th meeting, the Chalas agent, Darren Davidovich, uh, stated that the construction of the two residences were going to occur more or less simultaneously. That has clearly not occurred. Uh, we have been willing to accept the non-conforming situation on an adjoining property for over two years on the assumption that the construction of a principal residence was imminent, and that clearly is not the case. Um, so we have some new facts here, and I believe that the decision of the board must reflect those facts. Um, approval of the existing dwelling as an accessory dwelling in the absence of a principal residence, both now possibly for a protracted period, possibly forever. Um, basically, it basically endorses a concept that was labeled as virtually nonsensical at the October meeting. The notion that we have an accessory building on a lot that has nothing else into it, in other words, an accessory to nothing, was described as virtually nonsensical. And I think approval of this application essentially endorses the concept that everyone agreed was kind of ridiculous at the October meeting. So I strongly recommend that the board reject this application. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Gary. Who else would like to speak? Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to try and get a microphone to you so then people at home will, not, will be able to hear as well. I just, I just wanted to um, make certain that the record reflects the fact that my son Joseph, who is the owner of A1 or 1A section, was never notified about even the accessory dwelling. We never received any kind of notice about documentation of building plans or anything else to the property until. June 29th in a certified letter from the planning board. And as a result, I would strongly echo Mr. Lockman's position that we would never have approved of any kind of construction, given the fact that there's too many questions raised. There's another issue with all of this, and I'm not sure I would like clarification from the zoning board. There seems to be a question as to whether a and a residential dwelling can have a business in it, not a home office, but actually a kettlebell gymnasium. Now, is that legal in uh, a building like this? I, I, I can answer that question. It's, it's not allowed in the RC5 district, and we do have a letter from the owner of the property stating that that is not his intent and that and there will be no commercial use of this property it will be strictly a uh, single family residential use and we do have a letter from him to that effect um i okay um i received a letter stating somewhat the same however it is advertised on the internet as the rhinebeck kettle know. club yeah i i know of the I, i've been told that that was done because there's not another structure uh, he, that was the only address in Rhinebeck that he, that he had, and he was using that he's at this point. He's using it on his liability waiver. Yeah. He's using it on everything. No, so I, I agree, which is why I asked for clarification. Of, and given past actions, I'm a little doubtful as yeah. to the veracity of that. Well, j just so you know, so. We, it's not allowed in that district, so we would not approve anything like that in that district. It, it simply, it's not a permitted use in that district. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess this gentleman first, and then he's, he's closer to the microphone. Good evening, Wayne Thompson. I'm the attorney for the residents at 8, 12, and, and 16. I believe you all got a, a letter from, from me today, and uh, hopefully uh, you browse through it and we'll take time in the future to, to digest what's in it because this is a complicated and convoluted application that, that's faced with us right now. But um, I just wanted to, this is my first time here in front of the planning board, and I see everybody's got names in front of their their uh, themselves and, and I got a little worried when I saw the chairman here with his lunch bag I realized it was going to be a long meeting tonight so he's probably the only smart one there and somebody else brought a gallon size drink from from uh, Dunkin Donuts but she has no name in front of her so so who are you Gretchen, Gretchen. you're pleasure Gretchen yeah. I've spoke to you on the phone a pleasure pleasure to meet you and um, Ms. Uh, Ackman is in the back she recused herself yes. good good evening and well so now now that i i kind of know everybody i want what i want to i don't want to go over every detail in in my letter because the chairman has already indicated that you're going to have uh council look at the points that we've raised but i want to go back to um a, a point that uh uh mr blown made on a previous application in that there was a conservation easement or an easement of record that needed to be considered and made sure that it met, was, was cleared. The deed restrictions that, that we have here are very similar to, to an easement if you want to think about it in those terms. What it does is it encumbers one property, you know, a little bit heavenly bowling going on out there right now, and um, to the benefit of another property. These are recorded this deed restrictions and covenants were recorded. I guarantee you that the title company that represented Mr. Chihuahua or whoever purchased the property informed them of the deed restrictions because they're clearly on file because if I can find them then anybody can find them and uh, they're, they're rather obvious. These deed restrictions as, as has been mentioned run with the land and you can't have any more rights than what the property allows you to have. So for someone to say that they have five acres, they may own five acres, but it's encumbered by a conservation easement of four and a half acres, then really all they're dealing with is a half an acre because their property is encumbered by easements and restrictions. This is the same, far more specific here um, with respect to what can be done with the property. The reason it's recorded and can't be amended or changed without being recorded is to put subsequent purchasers on notice of all the lots of what they can and can't do with the property. Um, and in this case, we're not asking the board to interpret the deed restrictions. We're asking you to honor as an easement the fact that these deed restrictions are recorded and it's on the onus of the applicant to comply, to put plans forward that comply with all of the restrictions, covenants, and easements of record filed with the Dutchess County Clerk's Office. That it, no more, no less. Everybody is familiar with Central Hudson, uh, gas and electric underground easements. You can, you, heaven forbid, you start digging on your property if you have a gas easement. Um, there are air and light easements of records. You can't block people's air and light easements. There are all kinds of deed restrictions, covenants, and, and other easements uh, throughout this town and all the towns in Dutchess County. And you can't, I don't believe that the, this board can grant to an applicant more rights than he has under his title, um, what he, what his, property is not encumbered by. That's what the, the applicant seeks to do here. Now, this is um, a matter for counsel. I, I've made my point, I've raised it um, in, the, uh, in my letter. I also agree with the previous applicant that an accessory dwelling to nothing 
really isn't an accessory dwelling. I, I, I don't know how, how that works. I, I, it's it's kind of existential at this point in time. And it, 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 we're, we're, we're in a vacuum right now. And I just don't understand how that got, got to be. And if it is an accessory structure, I've detailed some of the violations of, of the town code, my interpretation of, of town definitions, that this structure, if it is to be deemed and renamed, relabeled, however the plan would be, may need ZBA variances as an accessory structure because of the way it was constructed. Not as a primary residence or principal residence, but as an accessory. For these reasons and others stated here, I just ask the board withhold the approval till these issues are worked out to the satisfaction of the board's council and the neighbors who have vested rights, who purchased their property with these rights in place. And we just ask that the board honor those vested rights of record. These are not rec uh, rights that they're pulling out of thin air, but they are rights of, of record. And we ask that you just uh, honor that by withholding any approvals till these issues are worked to, to everyone's satisfaction. Hey, thank you very much, thank folks. You. Pleasure to meet everyone. Gretchen, thank you for all your help. You're most professional in, with all your help whenever I've called. Thank, thank you so much. And that is on tape. Thank you. Um, Edna? Edna Lockman, uh, 20 Hagerty Hill Road. I am the immediate uh, adjoining neighbor. When you look at this uh, site plan, what you see on the adjoining property a line that I believe indicates this easement buffer. Is that correct? Yeah. This is this is here. This is the property line. And, and, and this line indicates the easement, easement buffer. buffer. The, the Why is there no line on this property showing the same easement buffer? It's, uh, um, it's, it's in the drawing. It's not turned up. I beg your pardon? It's not shown up. It's not. I have no. I have no reason that it's not shown up. It was all the design work was done with regard to that hundred foot. Buffer. Okay, and the other thing that's not shown here is the expansion field for septic. That's correct. The site plan shows what exists. This 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 uh, absorption field. Yes. Exists. Doesn't the expansion field also exist? Is that, that not required for Board of Health approval? It's required for Board of Health approval, but it wasn't required to be constructed. Right. So, but it, does, so it does not exist. It, it, it's approved. There's an approval for it. And I have, a, I have a health department of plan that shows the location of it, and it's adjacent to it. Okay. Uh, right. Am I correct that? in saying that the Board of Health approval is contingent upon an area here that will be an expansion field? That's correct. And so that expansion field is within this buffer that's not shown on this on, drawing. On this specific plan. Right. And the buffer in this area has mature trees, some mature trees on it, they would have to be removed if it were to be used as an expansion field. That's correct. When Board of Health uh, permit was sought, was, was the Board of Health aware that this area may or may not be available for an expansion field? I don't recall. As part of the original application in 2014, the deed restrictions were presented as part of the application. And there was, if I, I recall, specific <coughs> discussion about uh, the septic system and its location. So I, I did not do any of the presentation uh, to the planning board for this particular project. Right. But it was discussed. OK, so, so we don't know whether the county board of health is aware that this expansion field could be contested and, as a matter of fact, could be denied. Is that correct? Could be contested, I guess. And it could conceivably be denied, right? 
through litigation or denied, by whom? denied legally, either through arbitration or by litigation. By whom? By anyone who said this should not be an expansion field for septic because it has matured trees, it's in the buffer. The deed restriction requires that approval be sought from this property owner before it be done. I can't speak like so to the, uh, I guess I would refer to legal um, you know, counsel as to what the deed, restri deed restrictions require or what they allow, whether or not the uh, septic system is viewed as a structure, uh -huh. is it a utility? Right. Right, um, and so our, and so I can't speak to that. I think that would be more appropriately discussed by legal counsel. So you would say there's a question here that should be resolved. I'm just saying that uh, uh, to answer your question, I think it would be legal counsel that would never supply that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Uh, anyone else this evening who would like to speak? Anyone on the planning board have anything they want to say at this moment? I have, I have some questions about this. Um, uh, first of all, um, in terms of principal versus uh, um, you know, uh, secondary structure or contributing structure, where, where does this stand now? I don't know. I think that's a question either for the zoning enforcement officer and or our attorney. Okay. Mm. Um, or so second question is I'm getting a hum over here from Mr. Bro. He may have something to say to that. I don't think I, I frankly don't think the question needs to go that far. I think uh, Mr. Lackman was, uh, uh, was was spot on on this particular question. You sure as heck can't have an accessory building or an accessory dwelling on a site that doesn't have a principal dwelling. Uh, I don't know the I haven't seen the CO that um, may have been issued for that particular uh, dwelling, the one that was previously constructed. But there's no way in the world that it should have been issued as a CO for a accessory dwelling. It had to be uh, issued as a CO for a principal dwelling. That raises an issue that's not part of the application right now that needs to be. That would be if a new principal residence is going to be built on this site, and knowing that you can't have two principal residences on a single plot of ground, there has to be a procedure for the redesignation of the prior dwelling as a detached accessory dwelling, and if it does not meet the requirements of the zoning law for a detached accessory dwelling, area variance consideration would have to be afforded the particular matter uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. A uh, couple of just other brief comments. Uh, one is, uh, Mark, I think for clarification, I would show the reserved area for the SDS expansion on the site plan. Uh, just for clarification and, and disclosure, uh, the uh, I think uh, Michael has already indicated that uh, this whole matter needs to be referred to to land use council, and I think what needs to be sorted out uh, between uh, town land use council and council for uh, for neighbors, etc., uh, is the extent uh, to which uh, the town planning board uh, has a uh, a right uh, to. Uh, to enforce essentially uh, private deed restrictions. I don't think there's any question about the fact that they're, they're enforceable between the private parties, uh, but uh, there's a question as to to what extent uh, the planning board has a role in that particular, that particular process. Uh, the other point I, I saw, uh, and maybe there were, were additional plans, but the architectural elevations that I saw accompanying the, uh, uh, the submission were not stamped plans. Uh, they bear uh, the icon of uh, uh, Darren's business, the art of uh, building, but I don't believe there was an architectural stamp on, uh, on those plans. And uh, that's required as part of a uh, part of a submission to the board. I didn't hear his answer. Hmm? I didn't hear his answer. Yeah. Your, your, your response to that? We didn't, we couldn't hear your response? Oh, I'm sorry. I said the building department has the two stamp sets. Yeah, well, they, okay. just, just make sure a set comes into the board. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think, uh, you know, there's there's quite a bit of, uh, of legal work that needs to be done here. Uh, the board has a standing rule about uh, new information being submitted two weeks before before a meeting. So realistically, I think we're talking about a continuation of the public hearing to the August 21st meeting and not August 2nd. That's, that's basically what I... One more Sarah. question about that. I mean, uh, if 
maybe it has to go through litigation for us to find this out, but if there are uh, deed restrictions of a 100-foot buffer uh, on these properties, uh, shouldn't that be shown on any map that comes before us as well? I would like to think so, yeah. yes. I would think so. But um, I think what I'd like to ask the Planning Board to do tonight, I, I feel that there are a number of issues that need to be resolved. And a couple of things I'd like to see happen. We need to re return, refer this to our, um, our, our council, legal council, exactly what... One further it, issue. I'm sorry? One further issue. Okay, one, we'll have one further issue in a moment. I'd also like to strongly recommend that the uh, residents of this area who have these deed restrictions on their properties, if they could possibly sit down together and try to you know, work something out, uh, that would be very good. If you could do that, I, I don't know what the situation is. But obviously, as Art has pointed out, you do have the legal right to enforce the private parties through the deed restrictions since you're all party to those. Okay, well, I, and I appreciate that, but I think I'd love to see if that could happen. Uh, beyond that, I think we're definitely going to want to uh, continue this public hearing. Uh, do you, if the 21st would be what, about three, four weeks? Yeah, 20, 21st, whatever that is, it's five weeks now. Right? Five weeks, so that hopefully would give time. Eric. Just another point of clarification. Art said that um, he doesn't know if we have the ability to uh, uphold, and enforce to private force. But do we have any uh, restriction on going ahead and, as was mentioned, granting rights that are not beyond what the property owns? We question, question referable to council. Right. But okay. we, the planning board does, for any special use permit situation, does have the right to impose conditions that we feel are necessary <coughs> to issue that special use permit to mitigate any potential negative impacts it might have within a neighborhood, within an area, since it's a special use permit, the planning board does have that authority. Um, but we have to certainly justify any of those conditions that we place on, a, on an approval that we give. And for instance, on the, on the previous uh, submission, uh, it was said that the Winnicky board uh, approved the uh, transfer. Of yes. The, and what if they had not in that case? What if they had specifically said, we do not transfer this? Excellent Where would question. we be on that issue? I, that's another question we would ask John. Easements say for rights of way, things like that, obviously they go with the land and we know we need to respect those. Mm -hmm. Conservation easements, I honestly don't know. Uh, and this is even beyond a conservation, this is a filed uh, well, a conservation that, easement, that runs with the land. Well, a conservation easement is filed as well with the clerk and it also runs with the land in perpetuity. So to some extent they're somewhat similar. I just know that because we have one on our property. Oh, all right. so, 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 okay, so we'll have to find out from the yeah. where that The works. conservation easement situation that was before you also involved uh, not only an authorization <coughs> to subdivide, but also uh, an authorization to shift uh, a, a, a permitted building site with yes. the conservation yeah. easement. So it was, it was a little more complex. But one understand. additional point uh, that, I, that I do have, in light of the planning board's responsibilities as well as the, uh, the situation and the deed restrictions uh, with the neighbor review, et cetera, uh, one might argue that uh, to allow this application to proceed by deleting uh, a component, i.e. the carport, as a for instance, uh, is in fact a matter of segmentation under SACER. Uh, it's the uh, applicant's, I think, stated intention that uh, wants to build a house with the carport attached, plans for submitted architectural plans, et cetera, with the, with the, uh, the carport attached, and to consider the project other than that, I think, is segmentation under SACER. We have a lot of issues to deal with here. I so I think what I'd like to ask the planning board to do tonight is to continue this public hearing to our August 21st meeting at whatever, whatever time Turn Gretchen right. says. Uh, um, and I'm also going to, with your, with your permission, refer this to our town attorney, to John Lyons, to our, to our, our attorney. So would to, that, would that uh, meeting be based on that we get an answer from or some resolution from John or we would hopefully have John's I'm going to impress upon him the fact that we're continuing the public hearing until this date in hopes that gives him sufficient time to respond to our questions okay. um, I do not guarantee that will happen and if it doesn't happen then we will continue the public hearing again because we really need that information before I believe we need that before we can right. act so, Gretchen, I believe that's the first public hearing for that night, right? Is it or is it long? And long? Oh, I think didn't long, we do long? Long, 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 long right. So this is six forty. Right. Yes. Correct. Just a couple items, if I may. Uh, first of all, with regard to, uh, so this is a copy of the approved health department plan, and it was so it was approved 
and it was it was approved on <coughs> November 5th, 2014. And at the time it was submitted, uh, it actually shows the, the accessory structure in front of the principal dwelling, because that's uh, it was it was originally submitted in July uh, of 2014. So I think the applicant was going through that process of. Uh, of relocating the principal versus the accessory. Uh, what this also shows is it shows the deed restriction line um, on the plan, and it shows that the uh, expansion area is located uh, within that deed restricted area. So I know there was some discussion about it. I, I don't recall exactly what the discussion was. Um, but so the health department was aware of it and approved it. I, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly take uh, take a look at what, are, what you know the circumstances, but it's it's shown on the plan. And just for the board's you know clarification. Oh, also with regard to the health department, it wasn't approved for seven bedrooms. It was approved for six. Six. Five for the principal and one for the accessory structure. Um, the reason so on on the site plan, I showed what existed on the site plan, right? So that's what that's the reason I showed the primary. Uh, suits disposal area because that is, it exists it was constructed with regard to the hundred foot setback my error in not showing it I think this board knows me well enough I, I'm not trying to deceive the board in any way I, I, in fact I think I submitted a copy of the health department approved plans as, as part of and they're on they're on file with the town I believe you did yes yeah and so they're, they're you know it, cert, it certainly shows this information um, and so I will, uh, um, you know, I, I just, you know, like those two items, I just wanted to bring up. I mean, they're just, okay. you know, Thank they, you, they're, they're important to me to, to mm -hmm. mention that's important. Appreciate it. Um, okay, I think I have a, oh, do I have a motion to a, so moved. Second. a second? Aye. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good, thank you. All right. Oh, I think. I think we have an easier one this time. And I'd just like to know that Edna has returned to the planning board. Okay. We have another, another public hearing. Aaron and Margot Wilkenfeld, 12 Haggerty Hill Road, Subdivision Plan and Wetlands Permit. Conduct of combined public hearing on the applications by Aaron and, and Mark. And, Mar and Marco. Welcome to so, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to try and read this just once, so if you all could listen, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for subdivision plan approval under Town Code Chapter 101, subdivision of land, and for wetlands permit under Town Code Chapter 120, wetlands, in the matter of a proposed 2.025 acre lot line alteration between lots 1B and lots 1C, filed map 10386A at 12 Haggerty Hill Road within the Rural Countryside RC5 and Rockledge National Historic Districts, and authorization of a proposed house site on lot 1C with an adjacent regulated area of a pond located within reconfigured lot 1C being classified as an unlisted action under seeker. Marie. Okay. Um, the property that we are presenting for lot line alteration um, belongs to Aaron and Margo Wilkenfeld, who are the adjacent owners to the pre previous public hearing. Um, they own an eight acre, eight and a quarter acre lot with an existing house, driveway, garage, and they own a four acre vacant lot. And there is a pond on the four acre vacant lot, and their idea was to convey a two acre parcel of the eight acre lot to become part and parcel of the four acre parcel. Um, as you're now aware, there is a deed restricted area um, which in all honesty, at the time that this subdivision of this parcel into three lots, lot 1A, which was referred to by uh, the folks that were sitting back here, lot 1B and lot 1C, um, I did that subdivision in 2003 and was never made aware of the deed restrictions, the deed uh, restriction. So a Board of Health approval was sought and granted for a proposed house and proposed septic area. Um, as you can see from looking at the plan, the house is right up against the 
deed restriction line and the septic area and the expansion area are in the restricted area. The part of the proposal tonight is to slide the house forward, keep it, keeping it within the uh, outside of the deed restricted area. Um, the proposed septic and expansion areas are actually in open space. There's no trees in that area. So they'd be looking at excavating in a, uh, you know, digging for the septic system, putting the septic system in and putting the ground back to its original condition. The reason for moving the house forward is because town of Rhinebeck does not permit you to have a garage that faces the street. So in order to be able to drive into the back of their building and be able to have a parking area to put, you know, like leave their cars without having to constantly put them in the garage, we would slide the house forward and allow them to, um, bring the cars in from the back of the house. The advantage to doing that is there's kind of a small knob in this area where the house was proposed, and now the house will be moving in front of that knob, basically buffering it further from the lot in the rear. In addition, since 2003, the town of Rhinebeck has uh, instituted a wetlands law, and there is a pond on the property and now the town of Rhinebeck Wetlands Law says there has to be a 100 foot adjacent area to that pond. And the unfortunate thing is the 100 foot adjacent area butts right up against the 100 foot deed restriction. So the reason we're asking for a wetlands permit tonight is because we would like to be able to put the house in the 100 foot adjacent area. When we walked out there with the members of the Conservation Advisory Board, which were Melanie and Corinna, um, they could see that the where the house location is, it's, it's higher in elevation than the actual pond area. So there is uh, like a natural separation between the pond and the house site. And uh, I'm sure there's a report from the board, but uh, we didn't feel that there was a major problem in putting the house in the 100 foot adjacent area. They suggested that they put up silt fencing during construction phases and you know just general protection of the wetland. So uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I guess uh, yeah, for any questions. Okay, uh, the site visit was conducted by, uh, oh, me. Um, we yeah. went out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we glad I remembered that. Yeah, Eric was, uh, and Eric joined us, but he forgot. I didn't right. quite make that one. It was a good one. Uh, yeah. It's an absolutely gorgeous site. Um, the pond and separation is actually, there's a very strong physical separation, an upthrust of, of, of stone and whatnot. The pond is considerably further away and lower than, than the home site. And the home site, then uh, the, the land sort of slopes away from the pond area where the house is gonna go and where the septic field would go. Um, I personally, the one thing we did discuss was just, you know, best management practices during construction, silt fencing, whatnot, just to ensure that nothing goes down towards the pond. And any, any work in terms of drainage when the, when the uh, building permit's done, make sure that goes away from the pond, also away from the leach field so that that works properly. Beyond that, I thought it's a beautiful site for a home and I personally could find no problems with it. <laughs> and uh, perhaps Ryan's going to speak for the CAB? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, since uh, the two CAB met members could not be here tonight, we just echo what the chair raised and what was talked about during the site vi visit itself. So, thank we're, you. We're good. Yep. Uh, questions from members of the planning board. I just wanted, Eric, you said that the pond, uh, that the site slopes away from the pond. Right. The the pond is sort of over here. Right. Then there's sort of a rock up thrust, and then another one up over here, and then the house is over on the other side of the so land. So essentially, there's a way. rock barrier between yeah. the, the house site yes. and the pond. Yes. 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 I, I was impressed, um, <coughs> yeah, so. And how close to that rock then is this, is the house being? The rock ledge, the house wasn't all that tight on, on that up thrust as I recall. Now I think we had, I would say like probably 10, 15 feet yeah. of separation between the, where the house would be and where the edge of the rock would be. You're, you're not, mm -hmm. you're not perching the house on the edge of the rock. Right, right. okay. Yeah. Other questions? Members of the public? <laughs> Hearing no questions, um, I believe I have a seeker resolution for this. A seeker resolution and an approval resolution. Okay. 
pursuant to the planning board's classification of the proposed action as an unlisted action under seeker determines upon its review of the short EAF part one and its own completion of the next full EAF part two in consideration. Oh, did I say full? No, I said full. Oh, well, I, well, I meant short. In consideration of both the criteria for determining significance set forth at Title VI, Part 617.7C, NYCRR, including pertinent historic preservation policies that the proposed action, as described above, will cause no potential significant adverse impact on the environment and thus issues a negative declaration determination of non-significance under seeker, deeming an environmental impact statement not to be required and stating such will not be prepared. Two, authorizes the chair to so execute the full EAF and direct... Short EAF. The, sh the short EAF. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, you're just reading you know, I'm wrote. trying to be accurate here and directs the planning board clerk to distribute and file the executed determination of significance in the manner set forth within the secret implementing regulations, Title VI, Part 617.12 NYCRR. Could I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Very good. Uh, could I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. I will move on. Okay, in the matter of the application for subdivision plat approval on the project described above, Approves the application for approval of the, of the uh, Wilkenfeld Minor Two Lot Subdivision Lot Line Alteration Lots 1B and 1C, uh, filed map 10386A, and authorizes the chair to stamp and sign the submission, the subdivision plat upon the applicant's satisfaction each of the below conditions and requirements within 180 calendar days of the adoption of this resolution. One, stamping of the subdivision plat is non-jurisdictional subdivision for filing purposes only by the Dutchess County Health Department. Two, submission of final plat drawings in required form and number except as may be modified as to the number by the chair and bearing all required stamp seals, certificates, and notes. Payment of any outstanding fees and a reimbursable amounts due to the Town of Rhinebeck in the matter of review and processing of this application. B, in that no new lots or building sites are being created, deems not applicable th th to this application, either those provisions of the town land use subdivision regulations requiring the set aside of recreation land or cash in lieu of land payment to the town's recreation fund, or those provisions of the town zoning law concerning affordable housing requires within 60 calendar days of stamping by the chair, filing of the approved plat in the Dutchess County Clerk's Office, and two, in the matter of the application for wetlands permit, deems the proposed house site to have limited, if not negligible, effect on the proposed water resource with it required the water and the water resource itself be wholly avoided and that the recommended best management, erosion and sediment control practices be employed as any building construction and or related site development is undertaken within its buffer. And I think that would be one of the things that the uh, building inspector would put in, in the permit, I would imagine, I hope. Two, B, subject to the above grants the requested wetland permit for a period of two, two calendar years on the adoption of the resolution. It said two twice. In paragraph A, delete the word proposed, second line. Okay. Okay, in fact, on the water resource, with required, yes. Okay, could I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Could I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? I'll poll the board, Woody. Aye. Eric. Aye. Edna. Aye. Sharon. Aye. Melody. Aye. And I vote aye. And if you like, we have a lovely handout describing exactly what you need to do to get your final stamp and signing, and Gretchen will be glad to provide you with one. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Okay, we have one more public hearing. And I think, uh, <laughs> I think the ap applicant knows who it is. Ferncliff Forest Inc., 68 Mount Rutson Road, Site Plan Approval. Conduct of public hearing on the application by Ferncliff Forest Inc. for site plan review and approval under Town Code Chapter 125 Zoning in the matter of the proposed construction of a 615 square foot covered pavilion on a 194 acre parcel at 68 Mount Rutson Road within the Land Conservation LC District in the town's LWRA being classified as a Type 2 action under Seeker. Okay. Uh, 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 I'll just mention that uh, I'm, uh, I'm representing the Board of Directors of Ferncliff Forest. We'd like to build a 20 by 40 pavilion on a site by our newly uh, refurbished uh, pond uh, for the use of our uh, visitors who come to the forest uh, and uh, hope that uh, the project will move forward and we'll be able to raise the funds necessary to build it. Very good. Um, I think that um, basically we've covered all the pretty much the bases on this. Uh, the, does the mayor of the planning board have any questions about this? I have one question. Yes. Um, I was out there with Eric. Eric. Doing the site visit? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course. Uh, <laughs> people who did the site visit, please uh, report. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are no substantial issues. It is proposed that this lovely structure be put within a wood. And 
of course there was discussion about saving the very large mature trees, some oak trees, etc. Um, having built a house recently, I know how difficult it is to save large mature trees when there are big excavators roaming around anywhere near their roots, and by that I mean a very, very long distance from where the tree is. So it's hard, to, it's very hard to do. Uh, and I know that, you know, if you do it, you will make best effort to position it in such a way that you save the, the big trees. But the question I have is, you have this beautiful field before you reach the wood. Why don't you put it in that lovely field adjacent to the wood? That's, uh, I was not aware, nor is it planned to take or harm any trees. For over two and a half years, we had gigantic equipment in the forest. And we cleared almost two acres of those beautiful hardwoods because of a DEC regulation where we had to uh, treat the the uh, the, the uh, phragmites that we were taking out of the pond as hazardous waste. We could not move it off the forest. We had to bury it, just like uh, closing the town landfill, basically cover it with plastic, three foot of dirt. Uh, there is a place for this in that cleared area which qualifies, it's 100 foot away from the lake, and it's not on the fill area. The fill area cannot have a structure on it. Uh, when they were backfilling it, it looked like the bulldozer was riding a wave because that's the spongy material underneath there. So, and, and we're not going to excavate just for a slab. It's not going to be a deep excavation. So I, I, I'm not aware, Warren, that we have to remove any trees. Well, the location where we're showing this, which is uh, outside the 100 foot buffer for the pond and along the path, the wall, and so forth, is just beyond the clear area. Almost all that clear area is, in fact, the, where the spoils were deposited. And um, so it was a wooded area where we, where we found this, um, you know, on the map. Um, and we looked at the large trees. In fact, uh, Bob Donaldson was there from the SCA to be in the as well. But um, it looked like it would be perfectly possible to locate this in such a way that no significant trees would be disturbed. You're quite right that in the whole construction process, it's not hard to damage roots. The, the intention was to put under these post screw anchors rather than, uh, you know, excavate down with a large backhoe or something else. Um, so that would hold it in the ground and the slab would simply sit on top of the ground and a bit of gravel. Um, nobody can guarantee there'd be no damage to trees, but certainly by marking and staying away from the larger, mature and healthy trees, the intent was that but most of the growth that we would be disturbing would be secondary growth. Uh, at least that was the discussion we had you know, at the site that day. Warren, is this going to be a, just plain slab or a haunch slab? Or, or? No, it will be a plain slab. Plain the, slab, the, the and the screw anchors are for hold down? The anchors to hold it down, yes. Hold it down. Yes. So, so, uh, so the slab is going to be all that's going to be holding it up. Um, in other words, where your columns lie on the slab, that, that there's no reinforcement in those areas or well, no footings in these areas? Or? Sure, the, the slab would have some reinforcement. But the point is the slab is not carrying a load of the column. Now I'm just talking about the depth of excavation required for oh. the point of contact at the, at the columns. Right, well, you, it usually, well, it really depends on the length of the screw anchors, and it depends on the soil. We'll get a soil so you'll be using the screw anchors in compression at that point for, for uh, load bearing? No, they're, they're more primarily for uplifts. It's an open structure, and so it's more subject to wind whipping through and carrying away than it is to dead load, um, you know, even the snow load, because uh, it has, it has uh, trusses and ties that are holding the structure in place, but the, the wind is the bigger concern here. Uh, so the screw anchors will hold it uh, in the ground, and the slab is really just kind of create a level area there for people to, to use for a picnic. But the depth, the depth typically you're going to put uh, four to six inches of gravel down, and then the slab itself, uh, if it doesn't have dables on it, it's also going to be about four inches. And that would have so you, in just the process then, you're going to scrape off the organic matter that's there, mm -hmm. level it off with, with gravel, pour this slab on top of it. Right. Anything else? I have a couple questions. Yes. Two simple questions. Is there going to be any power to that building, to that structure? No power. And the next question is, what are you doing about security? Well, we have uh, obtained some trail cameras now uh, that use cell technology. 
Uh, we don't need power for them. They're, they're battery operated. We're looking into solar powered cameras. Yeah, because you have an invitation to. We do. I will tell you since our visitors have increased to somewhere between 15 and 20,000 a year, the vandalism is much less than it was years ago when hardly anyone was in the forest. There's hardly a weekend go by that there's not somebody camping in the forest. So with uh, those eyes, our vandalism is way down. However, well, we have incidents, like you might imagine, to an unattended uh, <coughs> park that size. Recently, uh, some of our violators posted stuff on social media. It cost them, but uh, <laughs> that's how we found them. Uh, so uh, they help us out sometimes. <laughs> But uh, we are looking into new technology, uh, and uh, we feel that uh, the cell technology is, is a good technology for a trail camera, mainly meant for hunting. Um, and it's also going to give us a better idea of who's in the forest and the quantity of people who are in the forest and when they're there. So we are investing some money in, in that technology. We recently made a purchase. Does the CAB have any comment they want to make? Good evening, Robert Donaldson, Conservation Advisory Board. I joined Edna and Eric at the site visit and I'd like to thank Warren for his time and information. Um, being that Franklin Forest is located in the Hudson River National Historic Landmark District in the Estates District Scenic Area of Statewide Significance, this project comes under a little bit more strict scrutiny. And the CAB looked at four items to begin with, the architectural style and location of the building would in no way it impair the scenic beauty of the preserved natural resources. Regarding the issue of trees, all right, there are a number of individual healthy trees at the site and along the trail from the parking lot up to the site. And the CAB asked that the project do everything possible to preserve these individual healthy trees. There's also an historic stone wall in front of the proposed pavilion and that of the pond. CAB recommends that every effort be made to maintain and preserve this historic stone wall. Now, all of these recommendations are found in New York Civil Rules and Regulation, the Town Zoning Code, the Comprehensive Plan and Policies found in the Town's LWRP, all of it which is noted in the LWRP that I prepared and presented to the Planning Board. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Bob. Are there any other uh, people in the uh, audience who would like to ask any questions or have a comment on this? Anything more from the planning board? Just, I'm, I'm still a little troubled about this slab. Um, being that you're not planning on taking in any large trees, those tree roots will be growing under this, this pavilion. Mm -hmm. um, what prevents them from causing upthrust of that, of that structure? It's really good at some point. Um, again, where we were locating this was, I think, far enough from the larger trees that it wouldn't be immediate roots, it would be a further out roots. Um, certainly, I mean, that's as we see in the village here all the time, eventually tree roots grow and if they come up to the surface for either water or sunlight, they can start to eat things. Um, you know, in concrete slabs, you don't have to be patched or repaired. There's nothing to guarantee. I think, though, that a slab is going to be a more durable, safer surface for people using the building than simply gravel, which would be another choice. Uh, that's a little higher maintenance choice. And, and in order to get the concrete to this site, uh, they're going to come down that little, little pathway? Kind of threading a needle to get it there to stay yes. out, of the, uh, out of the wetland buffer and off of the area of fill. Um, when they get close enough, they can obviously use a chute to get it to where it has to be. I think it's probably a little much to mix by hand, but that's certainly, certainly we can talk to the contractor about it. Mm -hmm. 
we'll have to do our very best, as Nick said, when they when they spent the multi-year project excavating out the pond and then moving the squirrels over here. I mean, the, the snow wall has survived, and there are cabins along there, so they right. should be able to do this. So okay, there was some gigantic people who removed some gigantic equipment up that road. No, I mean a little, the, not the big road coming up to the to the flat area, but next to the pond, but along the pond to get to this site. Yeah, but he had to get around the corner at the ranger cabin with that big equipment. Okay. Without bothering anything, to get all his equipment in the pond and the portion in the area. Right. It's not down the same path. It's right. Right. Off of the before you get to the corner, the, and before you get to the, the, the out, narrow path, the scout trail, trail is. It's easy. easily 10, 12 feet wide the whole way up. Okay. This would be one heck of an Eagle Scout project, huh? <laughs> We've had some duties. Yeah. Yeah. We, are the posts uh, pressure treated? Uh, we call for cedar. Pressure treated might be an alternative. Uh, okay. I've noticed recently pressure treated that only is like five feet above the ground level and the rest of it is regular. Oh, it's just dipped to a certain point? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. and they're laminate too. Interesting. I, I never knew that was around until I looked in the building recently that just happened. Any other questions? Okay, anything more from the public? Can I hear a motion to close the public hearings? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Since we wait for oh. All right. I have a <laughs> approval resolution. Okay. Um, you know what the project <coughs> is. One, deems the project to be consistent with pertinent coastal policies set forth within the town's LWRP. Two, in consideration of the nature and limited extent of the work to be undertaken, waives requirements for submission of any documents, drawings, or other data not heretofore presented, which would otherwise be required upon strict application of the submissions checklist set forth within town code chapter 125, section 125, dash 75, section sub C, subsection C. Three, approves the application under town code chapter 125, section 12573, and authorizes the chair to stamp and sign the site plan and to transmit signed copies thereof to the applicant, the CEO, and the building inspector upon the applicant's satisfaction of the following conditions and or requirements in the next six calendar months. A, submission of the above cited site plan for stamping and signature in the either the number specified under town code chapter 125, section 12578, subsection B, or as may be modified to a lesser number by the chair in consideration of filing and distribution requirements. B, payment of any fees or reimbursable amounts due to the town related to review and processing of the application. Uh, in taking this action, the planning board further authorizes the town zoning enforcement officer and or building inspector following receipt of the above cited site plan stamped and signed by the chair to issue first a building permit and the certificate of occupancy, certificate of use for the proposed covered pavilion upon his determination both the terms of this resolution and all their codes, laws, rules, or regulations within the purview of the CEO and or building inspector, including but not limited to the requirements of the Dutchess County Sanitary Code and the New York State Uniform Building and Building Construction and Fire Prevention Code have been satisfied. Michael, uh, yep. Michael and Ward, would you like to add to that um, a 3A, a new 3A, um, with, uh, with due consideration of the recommendations made by the CB, CAB in its report of such and such a date. I would not object to that. Right, because Are we comfortable with that? Specific yeah. Recommendations yeah. Yeah. About yeah. Keep those recommendations yeah. also be incorporated into this into this uh, so that a would, a would resolution be, uh, with due consideration of the uh, recommendations made by the CB, CAB in its report of. And then re, then we re, re, uh, figure accordingly. Okay. Anything else? Could I hear a motion to approve? Motion. Second. 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 Okay, I'll poll the board. Eric? Aye. Edna? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Melody? Aye. Woody? Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you very much. And that was our last public hearing. Sure. Not that we're done. Doesn't mean it's the last hearing. Okay. Uh, the next agenda item, regular business, Hudson Valley, Rhinebeck, LLC, 492 Eckerd Hook Road, subdivision plat, special use permit, site plan approvals, and wetlands permit. Status update on seeker That's compliance process in the, in the matter of a 12-room country in one and a status up, update on a 28 multifamily residential condominium project. And we all know what this is. And we can stop right there. And we can stop right there because... We can stop right there because the <laughs> seeker NOI distribution uh, on this project has not Taken place. yet occurred. Um, it will be occurring. Uh, Mark uh, uh, indicates it will be occurring tomorrow or the next day. Uh, that is a 30-day circulation. Uh, consequently, this matter has to be deferred until at least the meeting of August 21st. 
Well, that would be the earliest possible date at which you could assume lead agency status if the other agencies concur with your being lead agency. And once you assume lead agency status, then you can move on to the environmental right. review, et cetera. So this has to be a, a deferred until the uh, August 21st agenda. So it'll be a regular session item on August 21st. Okay, moving right along. Uh, the next piece of new business is Hudson Solar, 355 Wurttemberg Road, special use permit and site plan approval. Sketch plan conference with the planning board and, if timely, initial presentation of applications for special use permit and site plan review and approval under Town Code Chapter 125 zoning in the matter of a proposed ground mounted solar power plant on a leased portion of tax map parcel with a number given, owned by Barry Sherrod and located in the rural countryside RC5 and agricultural 20 districts and adjacent to a natural register property. Uh, planning board review and processing is made timely under Town Code Chapter 125 and Seeker. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm Jeff Irish, and uh, I wanted to uh, start by letting you know that we've uh, made some modifications to the site plan based on uh, meetings and comments we've received from uh, neighbors and neighboring properties. There was an updated site map that we uh, brought in this afternoon. It's revision L as in Leo, um, and that's the one we should be referring to. I'm going to explain, start uh, for the benefit of some of the neighbors who I see are here that I've talked to what the uh, changes were between um, what they've seen so far and what we're proposing. So I didn't, I didn't know that we were supposed to bring our own binder clips to get, uh, get drawings posted up here. So I'll have to show them one at a time. So the, um, the original site plan uh, that we submitted with the application and the, uh, the one that reflects the mock-ups that we put on the property is this one here. We originally proposed a long and narrow um, solar array field. Uh, we put wooden mock-ups to represent the height of the uh, array at the four corners and um, received some input uh, indirectly from the neighbor to the north, uh, directly from the neighbor to the south that they uh, could see them. Um, and so I went out, I did meet with the neighbor to the south on Saturday. We walked his property line and uh, he requested some changes and so we made some changes both to the north and the south. And that's reflected in the revision L drawings you have now. Uh, what we've done is we've um, uh, made it basically fatter and shorter in the north-south direction. Um, we pulled back uh, from the, on the north side about another 80 feet away from the neighboring property there. And on the south side, uh, we pulled back about another 86 feet. Um, the visual impact uh, is most possible from the neighbor to the south. The topography of the, of the site uh, makes this it's difficult to see from most directions. But the neighbor to the south, we also discussed um, his concern was the um, length of time. There's kind of a relative lack of vegetation on the south side there. So he expressed concern about the length of time for the additional screening vegetation to come in. Uh, we talked about perhaps fence that um, was opaque, had wooden slats or something, or an earthen berm. And I think. Uh, he and I would propose that we go with an earthen berm. Um, that provides immediate, permanent, four-season screening. Um, and we're talking about a vegetative berm there. So because of the size of the system here and the height that we would like to make that forum, uh, it involves another special use permit um, because we'd be going over 200 yards, probably in the area of about uh, 500 yards of clean fill brought in to make uh, an earthen berm that would have um, um, a topping uh, and a composition such that it would support uh, rapid growth of, of bushes and things that we plant on it. So um, along with, I guess in that vein, I have uh, another application because this, I understand this would require a second special use permit uh, because of the size of the berm. So I'll just send these down. Yeah. Give them to Gretchen. Yeah, give them to Gretchen. <laughs> Mr. 
So this is um, the latest plan, and now maybe I'll talk in general what we're, we're doing here. Uh, the state of New York um, has implemented a policy to encourage community solar systems. Uh, community solar systems are designed to enable the 75% of the population that cannot uh, site a solar system on their roof or on their property, either because they rent, they're condo owners, the roof isn't facing the right direction, they just don't want to have it there, um, whatever reason, to allow them to access the benefits of clean energy and to uh, lower their electric bills. So they've implemented this policy through Public Service Commission order. Um, they're permitting systems up to uh, two megawatts in size, which would uh, comprise about 14 acres. Um, uh, one by one, um, towns in the region have uh, addressed this by rewriting their zoning laws. Some towns have moved through that phase, some towns have not yet. Um, town of Claremont in Columbia County has, has done it. Town of Red Hook hasn't, has not addressed community solar yet. Town of Rhinebeck did, uh, town of Hyde Park has, Milan has not, so it's, it's kind of a mix. Um, the town of Rhinebeck uh, updated the solar zoning laws, local law two this year. Um, it was passed a couple months ago. Um, I participated uh, as a technical advisor on the committee that helped write the law. Um, I'm assisting many towns throughout the Hudson Valley area on the rewriting of their zoning laws uh, because solar is a new field and um, there's a lot of misconceptions and, and, uh, uh, and it's, hard, it's hard to keep up to date unless you're in the industry. So uh, I was a member on that committee. Um, the committee issued the law, the town board accepted it and so now we have the, uh, the law in place. Um, it's the most restrictive uh, solar zoning law and the longest that I've seen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so far, uh, but I think that suits Rhinebeck and suits uh, the nature of this community. So one of the things they did was they uh, restricted the size of solar systems to a maximum of two and a half acres. Uh, they've also uh, restricted the size through uh, the square feet of the module surface area. Um, they've limited the height uh, to 12 feet. Um, they've uh, limited the zones. They've put substantial setbacks in place and, uh, and required that there be screening uh, be considered and visual impact be considered. So um, it's, uh, I think it's a good law. I think it's right for Rhinebeck. Um, and it does permit community solar to be a uh, principal use in the RC5 district, which this property is located in. Um, the uh, property is a 16-acre parcel. Uh, it was purchased uh, in a tax sale. It's been largely neglected and abandoned for quite some time. Uh, there is a garage that's basically unused at this portion at this this time. That's on the property, and um, most of the area the area where we're considering putting the array is kind of up the hill uh, to the back of the property, where right now there's basically uh, scrub brush, uh, cedar trees that the deer nibble on and that kind of thing. Um, uh, the, uh, there is, there are some mature woods on the property. There's um, woods to the east and there's woods to the southwest. Um, our plan uh, leaves those intact. We do not, um, we're not going to be cutting down any mature trees. Uh, it also, um, I think, can shield, uh, allows for making sure that the, the system can be shielded from view 12 months a year. And a, a big part of that is to, the topography. I, I talked to the, ch um, the chairman about how to show that and, and show some pictures. Because this is just an application night, we can wait until the public hearing and I'll put up a screen and we'll show mm -hmm. pictures. We've um, done some drone shots in the area and things like that. One of the concerns in the pre-conference was that would it be visible from uh, the church, which is a historic site. Uh, we've overflown the church with a drone and you have to get up about a, uh, 100 feet above uh, grade in order to be able to see the field. So, and that's because there's a there's a rise up to about 430 feet and then the field drops in below. So we've done a lot of that kind of analysis to ensure that um, 
there not be a visual impact here? Excuse me, all, all your analysis was done based on no leaves being on the trees or? I uh, no. we're dealing with where we are right now. So that's why we're, um, that's why we're considering for the, the neighbor to the south, for example, the berm to make sure that uh, that the, he can't see it even when there is there are no so trees. So when the berm is in place, even no bare bare leaves, bare trees. I mean, uh, they will not be seen from any road he, or. Yeah, the screening property. the screening plan involves keeping the mature cedars. There are groups of cedars that have managed to survive the deer and get up, you know, to. 20 feet or so. Uh, we're maintaining all of those mature groups of cedars. In between there, uh, we're proposing planting some giant green arbor vitae, uh, and, um, which have been recommended by landscape architects for this uh, screening purpose. Those are evergreens that'll fill in the gaps. We have the berm. on top of the berm, we're looking at silky dogwood and forsythia, which again have been recommended by landscape architects. Densely packed, they can grow to be a, 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 a thick enough hedge that even if they were the only screening, it'd be difficult to see through them in the winter. But the uh, the setbacks that were um, that we've now got in place are pretty substantial. The required setback, uh, well, from the front is 100 feet by the new solar zoning law. We're 668, and it's up a hill, and it's it's heavily wooded going up that hill. Um, the north setback, required setback, is 50. With the new plan, we're now 172 feet from the north property line uh, and that neighbor. Uh, on the east, which would be the rear, there's a 50-foot required setback, and we're now uh, 220 feet from that. And on the south, there's a 50-foot required setback, and we're now at 193 feet. It's almost four times the required setback. And um, so we think... Uh, that this plan can meet the use, uh, meet the requirements of the screening. But you know, we're willing, certainly willing to continue to meet with the neighbors. The next step is um, for those that have seen the mock-ups uh, that are out there, we're gonna be going out this week. We're gonna be taking those down and moving them to the new positions so they can, uh, so we can verify that this plan is a, the improvement we think it is. So other than that, I, I believe uh, we're, we're compliant with zoning and it is a permitted use in the district, so. I have a question. Your yep. overall site plan shows on the uh, eastern edge, uh, 410 feet long from property line, from here to here. There's your 410. Shows the, 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 the field shows yeah. is 446. And the unit no, is the, four, the 410, those are contour lines. Line, contour line? There's a contour line? Which line? I've never seen a straight line contour line in my life. That's not meant to be the property line. See what I'm saying? I interpret this as to be from here okay. to here. So he's referring to this area here. The, um, the 410 is referring no, to the contour line, which is coming in on a diagonal. It just happens that the 410 label has been placed on the East property okay, line well, purposely to confuse a, you, I think so. Well, no, I, I usually confuse, okay, no, but I, I just think I it's confused so somebody should because okay, because your array is 446 feet and it doesn't, no, it doesn't okay, jive. Over, yeah. over the edges. So the, the lines, the uh, they range from like 380, 390, 400, 410, 420, 430, those are the contour lines. All right, so the questions, members of the planning board, contour here. Mm -hmm. No questions? Well, I, I do have a question about, uh, some mention was uh, when we talked earlier, I, I spoke with this gentleman at the, uh, the um, uh, uh, farmer's market the, this weekend, because uh, he had a booth there talking about it, and I asked some questions, and he mentioned a bond for the, right. uh, for the, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, the decommissioning, decommissioning. of the, uh, this, uh, it, 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 when that time came. What is the, how much is that bond for and what, what makes us think that that's an adequate number? Uh, well, the, the, the idea of having to bond for the decommissioning has come from New York State. 
uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority drafted a model solar zoning law that's been used by many towns and it's been kind of adapted and modified from there. It, it requires or suggests decommissioning. Um, uh, the town of Rhinebeck adopted uh, decommissioning. Some towns have not, but Rhinebeck did. It requires uh, decommissioning at the end of the useful life and it, require, it allows for the town board to require the posting of a bond. Um, NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, has done an analysis and come up with um, decommissioning cost ranges that they think are reasonable. Um, we took that, uh, we independently did a time and material study of our own and we're within, you know, plus or minus 10% kind of thing. Well, so, how much is that? Uh, it is about $17,000. $17,000, and what would that entail? Does that include uh, removal from the site and recycling of the material? Yes. Removal yeah. from the site and landfilling of the materials? Remo yes. Yeah. Yes, the, all, both of those? Yes. Okay, yes. so some of the materials would be landfilled, some of it will be... Um, very little gets landfilled. There's... Um, and in fact, as the, industry, as the industry now starts to go through uh, analyzing the decommissioning, they're finding that the scrap material value is, is far in excess of the cost to decommission, typically. There's, this system would comprise of uh, um, steel posts, uh, steel wire for the fence, mm -hmm. which would get recycled. Uh, the next major material is aluminum, which is the rail and mounting system. Uh, they're stainless, all the hardware stainless steel. Uh, the solar modules themselves have an aluminum frame, uh, a glass sheet, which is recycled, and then the, uh, the silicon film and the plastic back sheet would get, have to go treated to a, to a transfer station. Um, the other than that, there's buried what, copper what is, wire, and that's pretty what's much involved it. in the treatment of the, of the cells. Um, I don't know what what the process is, honestly. Because I mean, just uh, I did a quick, uh, you know, googling of uh, possible toxic chemicals in, in these things, and and it's significant. Um, and there's it's unknown about uh, recycling because it hasn't been done yet, or it yeah. hasn't been done to any degree that they they know. So I'm just you know I, I just want to make sure that. The bond we have to cover this is going to actually cover it, and I don't see how that info, how we're going to get that information. That's okay. right. Well, that's something we can look into. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Jeff. The bond is also approved by the town board. Right. Pardon me. The bond is approved by, approved by the town of right. board upon recommendation of the town attorney. Yeah, he's working. Correct. He's working and on I, it now. I've met with the I've met with the uh, the town representatives of the town board and the town attorney, and they're looking for. Uh, direction from the planning board as to the commissioning, w whether you recommend it, whether you, what you think of the cost, and then the town board will decide on the bonding and the manner of the bonding. Any other questions for Jeff? Okay, I have a procedural resolution. A couple so of, uh, I just have a couple of uh, additions to the procedural resolution. Uh, the first is at the end of the opening paragraph. Uh, there's no reference here. I, I had no reference in the resolution to the site plan that was in, uh, being set. So it's set forth within a site plan dated, uh, I don't see a date, but revised to July 17, 2017. It's, yeah, it's on the bottom right corner of the drawing. The original date? Today. The I see only, a re maybe I'm missing it, Jeff. I see revisions A through A, A through L, but I don't see an initial date. You mean the initial date at the time of application? The initial date of the, pl of the plan. Um, Sometime prior to revision A, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, there were multiple revisions okay. for Central Hudson and for the state of New York before so it came to this board. So anyways, the plan revised to July 17th. Yeah. Uh, the uh, second point, and it uh, follows on something that uh, uh, actually it relates to paragraph one. Uh, with respect, again, uh, with respect to any matters to be considered at a public hearing, uh, those materials need to be in the planning board office two weeks before the meeting. So I would add, you're accepting the uh, applications for initiating review 
but add to that any further submissions to be considered at the public hearing shall be provided to the uh, planning board's consultants and available for review at the planning board office not later than August, August 7th. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let me and ask that's questions not necessarily about that. a slideshow if you have something of that sort. That's right? what my question but was. But any, yeah. any, any drawings or you, okay. you mentioned some, uh, uh, some photographs and things of that sort. That needs to be available for, for public review in advance of the public hearing. And the okay. here is two weeks beforehand. Okay. Okay. So those are the only changes in the, in the resolution. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the Town of Rhinebeck Planning Board hereby acts as follows. On the below listed May 15, 2015 application by Hudson Solar for special use permit on site plan review and approval under Town Code Chapter 125 zoning in the matter of a proposed ground mounted 432.9 kilowatt solar power plant within a 2.18 acre fence area on a leased portion of a 16.1 acre parcel owned by Barry Sherrod and located within the natu rural countryside RC5 and Agriculture 20 districts and adjacent to a, natural, a national register of historic places property. One, accepts the application is adequate for initiating technical review of the project by the planning board, its consultants, and the public. Two, classifies the proposed action as an unlisted action under seeker. Can you type one because it's adjacent to St. Paul's? Your landmark? Yeah, the, the two properties are, I believe that's immediately adjacent. I don't think it, don't think it exceeds the, does it exceed the 25% rule for an adjacent? I don't know. Well, it's, frankly, there's, if it's a type one, coordinated review is required. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that raises an issue because there are no other agencies involved here, right? Uh, nice, nice. Surter is, is requesting that this board declare lead agency status, and they need verification of that. Okay, let's because of the history. Yes, you know, frankly, Nice might also be in the same position as DEC. Jason to the historic property requiring a sign off from DEC. Yeah. Nice. So I think type, yeah. type one is the conservative way to go okay. here. Yeah, NYSERDA, or I'm sorry, the DEC has already uh, reviewed this project and, and declared they don't have an issue with it, but yeah. in its informal pre-application phase, informal. I'll put that yeah, way. There's yeah. a provision in 1409 yeah. that may be different than that. Yeah. One of the first things we do is run these projects through yep. DE biologists. They're instructed to come out uh, quickly and do uh, an environmental study for all of these uh, projects because they are encouraged by the state. So they've they have done that part. Okay. Uh, it, therefore, it's classified proposed action as a type one action under seeker declares its intent to serve as lead agency yes, and authorizes the planning consultant to prepare an appropriate NOI. Yes. Cool. Uh, I do we have, does the applicant have to apply for a mining permit since he's saying he's got 480 cubic yards of material coming in for the berm? Yes. Jeff's indicated that, uh, for the special uh, major excavation. that he's applying yes. for major excavation. Okay. By the yes. way, in this resolution, in at a couple of points where the term special use permit is used, special use permits. Right. Yeah. For both, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, Three, request technical review of the applications be initiated by the town planning consultant and town planning engineer with request made for return of comments no later than August 14th, 2017. Refers the applications to the town's conservation advisory board for initial review and comments with request made for return of comments not later than August 14th, 2017. Refers the applications for special use permits and site plan review and approval to the Dutchess County Department of Planning and Development for review and advisory opinion. Refers the applications to the nearest State Department of Parks Parks and Recreation, Historic Preservation Bureau for review and advisory opinion with request made for return of comments not later than August 14, 2017. Refers the applications to the town historian for review and comment with request made for return of comments by August 14, 2017. Schedules in conjunction with its initiation of coordinated environmental quality review under seek or a field visit for planning board and its advisors to walk and observe the project site. Um, and who would like to go? I'll go. Edna? I'll go. Eric, would a third person like to go, given? <laughs> okay, you guys can. <laughs> Eric and Edna. Do you have a date target range or something for that? Can um, we uh, coordinate with you by email? Yeah. 
Do we have your email here? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. We'll and schedules a combined public hearing on the applications for Monday, August 21st, 2017 at 645. 6.45. And directs the clerk to provide or otherwise cause notice thereof in accordance with the requirements of the town's zoning law. Could I hear a motion to approve? So moved. A second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Very really good. Um, and at this point, there will be a more greater visual presentation yeah. on this project. And uh, everyone with any interest, concerns, or anything is invited to speak. You can certainly send written comments. Uh, you can all speak. You can do both. Um, the idea of the public hearing is to hear what everyone has to say and what their concerns are. Okay. Well, have him, if he can't make it uh, for the public hearing, you know, have him submit his, his concerns and feelings in writing so we have that on the record. We'll do. And then I guess I would just ask Ms. Sherrod, if you are um, a relative of Barry's, if you're going to recuse yourself for the public hearing, and, and perhaps why you can recuse yourself tonight, and, and that would just be my last question. Okay. That's, is there, is there that'll be up to you to decide how you feel you need to do. I have no Could no. affect a quorum on the 21st, though. Ooh. Oh, crap. I mean, crud. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're down to five I mean, people. I guess my question is, are you a relative of Barry Shroff? He's my brother-in-law. Yeah. Okay, so the answer is yes. Yeah. And I would say to the board that I'm an attorney. I can read a statute. I don't practice mm -hmm. law. I don't think that the board can do anything to affect the quorum. And I would just ask the board to consider that it's not permissive. It says you shall recuse yourself. Um, and it's section 17-3, subsection 1, subsection 2. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we'll see you all on the 21st. Uh, okay. Yes. Is the uh, planning board site visit open to the neighbors also? Or is it a closed session? That's pretty much up to... Uh, I would suggest that the neighbors arrange their own visit yeah. and not come with planning board members. My experience, my experience with neighbors, and I had one of these experiences, it can be a disaster because it's a technical meeting between the planning board and the applicant. And that's what it's for. At best, they can stand and listen, but what happens is they all have their own little views and they're not all necessarily the same as the applicants. And it becomes a goat roast. It's very hard to manage. But I, that's my own view. But I, well, I think that that's something that the applicant, I know mean, for a number of our applications, the applicant has actually invited the neighbors to come and to then take them through the property, through the project, and explain what's going on. And I, I think in this case, um, I, my main um, desire would be that, that I get to go onto the neighbor's property mm -hmm. once we reposition the uh, the mock-ups and to see well, if there's any visual. Maybe a little impact. quid pro quo. They'll let you walk on their property. You let them walk on yours. Okay. <laughs> it's that it's yeah. That, that's that that's a catch I think you I think you need to understand the planning board is not a legislative body we cannot adopt laws only the town board can do that we also can't give relief from laws only the zoning board of appeals can do that all we can do is review and approve applications that come before us under the law that has been basically that has been developed and approved by the town board we don't have that legislative ability This is this is just a. No, no. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. What you need to understand. 
But you need to please excuse me for a minute. This is not a public hearing. This is not a public hearing. As I've ex listen, excuse me, excuse me. I know you're upset, and I understand that. But right now, all we have done is accepted the application, and we are now referring it to a number of different agencies and people to refer back to us on exactly what the impacts will be. It's not my property. Well, it's not his property. But well, he's going to lease a portion of it, and that really is is that is his decision. We can't order him to allow other people onto his property. Well, I don't, I imagine, I mean, my advice would be, yeah, I think the best thing to do is to invite people to come and see what's going on and see exactly what's entailed. But when we get to the public hearing, not only are you going to have what little bit we had tonight, you're going to have all the information from all of our different consultants who have looked at this. You're going to have every opportunity to ask any question you want, state any concern that you have, bring any uh, visual things that you want to bring to this. That's what the public hearing is for. Right now, we're just accepting the application. And we have to do that before we can begin the review process. We haven't we haven't agreed or approved anything. Yes. There will be down to four members that I know of right now. Uh, I know that Woody will not be here. Uh, I know that Richard Melody will not be here. Uh, and if Richard doesn't show up. Uh, we will not have a quorum. I'm sorry? Well, we would have to postpone it. We would have to postpone it to our, our September meeting, which I believe is September 18th. Do we only know until the meeting? Well, that is kind of a problem. Okay. I'm just, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know why Richard's not here this evening. I. We didn't hear. We didn't hear. He didn't, he didn't explain in his email why he's not here. He's yeah. So, but I just know that two members won't be here, and so we're down to five. And then if Richard, for some reason, isn't here and Sharon recuses herself, then we're down to three, and we can't, we can't act. Absolutely. You know, as soon as I know, I'm going to try and see if Richard can make it on the 21st. Um, if there's some reason why, you know, if he's going to be out of town or something, I don't know. But yeah, that if we don't have a quorum, yeah, we can't, we can't proceed. And I want to invite you all to come. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to hear what your concerns are. But you know, legally, we can't allow just you to speak because we haven't announced this public hearing to a lot of other people who might want to speak. And in fairness, we have to allow it to be open to everyone who might want to speak, which is why we go through the notification process. Uh, that's the way that has to work. And the public hearing will remain open as long as it has to. Uh, it not, is not necessarily going to close on that first night. There may be other issues that need to be addressed and looked at that we don't have sufficient information on. So, just what you heard tonight was just a procedural resolution to get this whole review process started. Um, that's just the first step. No, and that's fine. I'm, I, as I spoke to a number of you today, I encourage you to come tonight so you know what's going on, when it's going to happen, and what the different things are that we're going to be looking at. To the best of our knowledge, we expect and hope that you will also bring to us things we may have missed, many things we've overlooked because we're not aware of them. So that's part of what we also hope to get from the public hearing. So. Okay, thank you. I guess we're good for right now. Yep, thanks. Okay. And I appreciate you coming. And if you do have questions about what's going to happen when, you can always call the office. Uh, a number of you also know you can call me. And if I know anything, I would be more than happy to tell you. All right, we have a couple more items on the agenda. I don't know what we did there. Did, 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 did we accept this yes. application? I can't remember. Didn't we accept yes. it? Did. Yeah, we yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. Oh. We did. That's what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was something. All right. Next a, item Barry oh, yeah. Niemers, 9 Charles Street, Certificate of Demolition or Removal, Special Use Permit, Site Plan Approval. Sketch Plan Conference with Planning Board, and if timely, initial presentation of applications for Certificate of Demolition or Removal, Special Use Permit, and Site Plan Review and Approval in the matter of the proposed renovation of a single family dwelling uh, within the Rancliffe Hamlet and Rancliffe Overlay Districts and the town's LWRA and Planning Board Review and Processing as may be timely under Town Code Chapter 125 and Seeker. Mr. Wills. Mr. Trimble, 
Hi, everybody. Um, my uh, client, uh, Barry Nemers, has uh, lived in Rhinecliff for about 30 years, um, bought a house adjacent to his, um, the house in question here. It was in very bad shape. It's next to the, just to the north of the old post office in Rhinecliff. And um, uh, he, what, what's before you today is the uh, renovation of that house, the exterior renovation. Um, if you, if you might remember back uh, in winter, um, we had a uh, pre-application meeting regarding work that was being done on the interior of the house. There were a lot of code violations, uh, found, uh, foundationless additions that were on there. It was a real health and safety issue. Things had to be dealt with then, which is why we uh, came in uh, to do the interior work. Those were not issues that, that uh, germane to the planning board. But now we're coming in for the uh, exterior work. So that obviously requires um, planning board approval. So that's why we're here. Um, uh, Victoria Polidoro submitted um, the application. Um, she's not able to be here today. So I'm here with uh, Stephen Falk, the contractor, to answer your questions. Uh, we're hoping that uh, what Victoria submitted was complete. Uh, she went through a long form seeker and I, th I think she went over and above what needed to be submitted normally at this point in the process. But um, I think you have a full picture of, of what's uh, entailed with this project right now and uh, I'm here to answer your questions and hopefully move it forward. Questions for Bob? I'm sorry? No, I think it's good application. I mean, complete application. Okay. It's a complete application. Uh, to move it along, as suggested, we've got a procedural resolution. I think it stands as, uh, written. as, as written. Uh, we need to designate a couple of uh, board members for a field visit, and uh, there'll be a public hearing. There'll be a public hearing on August 21st. Okay. The fact that you might not have a quorum on the 21st, how does that affect uh, the, the public quorum, The quorum situation was only concerned uh, oh, Sharon's recusal yeah, on one particular right. item. Yes, because oh, that, everyone else yeah. has promised to show up. Yeah, very good. Yeah, Except so we don't need respect to that item. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So, so far, everyone's dropping like flies from Lyme <laughs> disease, so I guarantee nothing. So, but let me read this. Is I'll this say it for the day of the solar eclipse? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh, you probably. Do okay. you need to read it? The Town of Rhinebeck Planning Board. Do you need to read it? Can you summarize it at this point? You really want to go home, don't you? I do. <laughs> Jeez. I was hoping to wear this shirt tomorrow to work. But yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it, Bob. <laughs> okay, the, ap the application is adequate. Uh, it's an unlisted action under Seeker. Uh, the town's CAB is going to look at it. Um Street Permit Approval, Dutchess County Planning is going to look at it. So uh, I'm sure you have friends there who will take care of that. Uh, it's going to uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, Historic Preservation Board. It's going to the town historian. And who wants to go to Ryan Cliff? I'll go. Who's going? I'll go. Edna and Melody. No, no. Yeah, oh, Eric. Oh, I, I thought I said You said it too? Oh, I, Eric. Go ahead. No, I didn't no, say Eric, it. No, Eric, I'm sorry. I, I, took my I glass. thought I said it, but... Uh, it I took my glasses off. I can't see that far. Okay, it's <laughs> Eric and Melody. Okay, and we're going to have blood is for punishment. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's what they get paid for. And we'll have the public hearing on the 21st at? 650. 650. Okay, can I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve? A motion. Second? Second. Second, yes. Well, you guys, come on. All in favor? Aye. Okay, very good. Coordinate with Melody and Eric on the site visit. Okay. Very good. Melody. Well, okay. Well, we, I have Melody's uh, email, so I, I can get that to you. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Our last and, item. Oh, and one, one other thing. I'm sorry. Uh, with, with my uh, Dutchess bad. County planning hat on, I have absolutely nothing to do with referrals. So, <laughs> thank you, Bob. All right. Should we have also hmm? okay. Did we do both zoning? Yes, we yes. did. Yeah, the zonings are done. Okay, what we have next is a wetland permit. <laughs> Um, what we're asking tonight is to approve the wetland permit. It is a um, situation in which the people are going to build a house and yeah, the, so what? Well, they have a house. Bring addition, I'm sorry, an addition on the house. And it's going to be approximately three feet into what has been described as a wetland buffer on a map. And um, ordinarily, we 
ask a whole process to go through and all this sort of stuff. Given that it's three feet and, you know, I, I'm going to ask you to approve the wetland permit tonight, so I'm going to read this to you. Okay. All right. Uh, the Town of Rhinebeck Planning Board hereby acts as follows on the May 25th, 2017 application by Christina and Robert McClinchy for wetland permit under Town Code Chapter 120 wetlands in the matter of a proposed encroachment into the regulated buffer area of a, of a portion of a proposed 644 square foot addition including related site grading to a single family dwelling on a 0.55 acre parcel at 3 Hickory Drive within the RM1 residential moderate and density district. One, accepts the application of wetlands permit including required fee and sketch plan as adequate determines that there will be no public interest to be served through the conduct of a public hearing and deems that such will not be conducted on this application for wetland permit, determines with the concurrence of the Town Conservation, Conservation Advisory Board the work subject to the application for wetlands permit to have had negligible, if any, impact on the protected wetland stream wetland, for grants the within condition, the condition requested by the wetland permit and authorizes the chair to so advise the ZEO and or building inspector upon stamping of the site plan upon satisfaction of the other conditions and or requirements set forth within the Planning Board's earlier resolution. Could I hear a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Second. Discussion? I'll poll the board. Eric? Uh, sure, why not? Aye. <laughs> Edna? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Melody? Aye. Uh, Witty? Aye. And I vote aye. So you've got your wetland permit. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you for your time. I, I appreciate your patience with sure. this. Um, so. <laughs> you're good. You, you should be able to get a building permit. Hope we found an education. <laughs> uh oh, we have an item before adjournment. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Windows without trespass. Folks, one major item before major pronouncement before adjournment. You have no agenda for August seventh. Bravo. There are no new applications. Boom. It was the application deadline. You have no, no agenda. So we scared August. them all off. We didn't. We didn't. Pretty roll good. Anything everything, gets that day? everything got rolled to the twenty first. So do we show days, up? <laughs> do we yeah, show do, up? What do we do at a, a meeting um, like that? Can we just cancel due to lack of interest? Yes, you can. Uh, I would say that uh, you. Uh, that was uh, that was scheduled as a special meeting anyway because yeah. your regular meeting is August twenty first. So can cancel we the special that, meeting right. for August seventh. Could I have a motion to cancel the special meeting for August 7th? So Second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you all very much. Who, uh, has, who has the uh, solar energy? Yeah, we have to adjourn. Pardon? Who has the what? Who has the solar energy site vision? Edna and I. Okay. The first thing you're going to look at is a driveway that's, that has no turnoffs. And um, it's like so it's like oh, we have an 800 adjourn? feet yeah. long. Do we want to adjourn before? Do you want to adjourn? Yeah, sure. I just want to make sure they know because yeah, I'm, let's adjourn. I'm not around. Let's adjourn so we can turn this off. Make a motion we adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We stand adjourned.